Good morning and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Dave Deacon and this morning on the show we're going to start out here at the North Range and and Dave we're doing so because we're going to dispel some some uh, some old wives tales of cattle production. We might do that for sure. <laughs> uh, so yeah we've got an interesting project going out here. A few uh, I don't remember now how long it's been but a few years ago we talked about a super cow. Yeah I remember. That's kind of what we're trying to figure out here. How, how are you doing that with the research that you're conducting? So we, you know, in the previous episode, mm -hmm. we, uh, dis, we sort of defined that cow as efficient, basically from her record, her production record. The piece we didn't have on that super cow was how much does she eat? Mm -hmm. Now, if we assume that the cows on this project are, are adequate or really good from a reproductive standpoint, we're trying to figure out you know, if there's any opportunity to increase or improve beef cattle production uh, with an efficient cow that's efficient in terms of forage use efficiency. And, you know, thanks to uh, a uh, forward-thinking uh, alumni, mm -hmm. you know, they, they provided some funding to help us install this more technical equipment uh, that measures individual feed intake. Right. And in this study, we're providing them all the feed they want. So we're trying to see Given a pasture with lots of grass, you know, it's, a, it's an indicator of how much feed those cows will consume on a daily basis. So, so we pulled out two cows that we thought would be interesting just as an example right. of what we're trying to accomplish and the opportunity that we may have going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so these two cows are uh, very, well, I'd say similar in their production record. Mm -hmm. uh, one cow, uh, let's see, the cow on the left right. uh, is she's a little bit smaller mm -hmm. okay she weighs about 80 pounds less on average than the cow on the right this cow on the right is about a 1170 pound cow she weighs about uh, 1080 okay. or sorry 1180 so she's she's about oh depending on the day 80 to 90 100 pounds sometimes lighter right uh, which one would you think would eat less forage Oh boy, uh, yeah, that's that's a tough question. The smaller cow, right? You would think, yeah. right? Well, it turns out uh, she's kind of a big eater, huh. according to our data so far. Right. She's consuming 33 pounds on a daily basis. The 4002 cow, the smaller cow. Okay. Uh, this cow over here on the right is consuming 13.3 pounds less every day, and she's 100 pounds heavier. So uh, you can't tell by looking, and that's, and that's what makes it fascinating. And it looks like there's a lot of opportunity for progress. Well, and, and that's one question I was gonna ask was, what is the possibility of, of, of measuring full efficiency of the cow moving forward? I mean, that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. Hopefully what we can do is find cows that rank rank cows right. for feed intake mm -hmm. all right and at forage intake in particular low quality forage intake where or moderate quality forage intake kind of where a commercial cow has to make her living right right and so if we can rank cows in groups and contemporary groups for that trait we can make a lot of progress on on that characteristics and and then of course you know there's always going to be the other criteria you'd like to sort for and fertility being mm -hmm. number one uh, but uh, there is, looks like there is a tremendous amount of opportunity to accomplish that. Okay, thank you very much, Dave Lawman, yes, beef cattle specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Summer is a very busy time out on uh, most Oklahoma ranches, especially once haying season gets underway. One of the uh, chores that we can't just let fall through the cracks because we're so busy in summertime, is checking to make sure that the cows are getting the mineral intake that they need out on the, the summer pastures. Checking these mineral feeders on at least a weekly basis, I think is very, very critical. It's especially important if uh, you and your veterinarian have agreed that you need to put out a medicated mineral. Uh, one that might be helping uh, prevent anaplasmosis or some, some other uh, disease malady that they're trying to prevent. 
And of course, we want to remind you that if you're using any kind of a uh, medicated mineral, you and your veterinarian have to agree on a, what's called a veterinary feed directive. And you'll fill that out and have that in place for wherever you purchase medicated mineral or feed. Now these mineral feeders, the location of them I think is, is really important so that you make sure the cattle get access on a regular basis to the minerals that, that you're providing for them. Placing them in those areas where cattle are most likely to lounge and spend a lot of time. Such things as around the watering source, in shady areas, any place that you see the cattle that uh, congregate and spend a lot of time in that area is a good place to uh, place your mineral feeders. How many mineral feeders should you put out? Well, the general recommendation is that you have at least one feeder for about every 30 cows or every 30 pairs. And certainly uh, don't go past about 50 as a maximum in order to get the kind of intake of the mineral that you desire. I suggest that you download an extension bulletin. It's E-861. It's a feeding of vitamins and minerals to grazing cattle. Has a lot of great information about which minerals match up with different situations as far as the forages that we have here in Oklahoma. There's another piece of uh, software that's available through the OSU Extension Service. It's called a mineral intake calculator that'll help you outline how much mineral is going into these feeders each week compared to how many cattle are in that pasture so that you can calculate whether you're getting the actual intake that you think they need. I think if you'll do the simple preparation of watching these mineral feeders throughout the course of the summer, making sure that you have fresh, dry mineral available to those cattle in those areas where they're most likely to uh, achieve it, then you'll get the mineral intake that you want and have a more successful cattle nutrition situation going through this summer and fall. Hey, we we'll look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Well, all this rain that we've gotten has been great for flies and mosquitoes, but Tom, how's the rain impacted some of the crop uh, pests that we have for our summer crops? Well, time will tell. Um, I, I'm seeing a little bit of activity right now in, in these crops uh, with fall armyworm, which uh, tends to like corn and sorghum at this growth stage. And uh, we, you know, everything's planted later, so um, we might see some just different things happening with with some of these insects that that we might normally expect to see at a certain time. You know, we've had we've had a lot of rain, and it's always kind of hard to 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 figure out whether we're going to have uh, you know a certain if if it impacts certain insects or not. But we're starting to get those southern uh, winds coming up, and I'm expecting to see things like fall armyworm come in um, and be a, an issue later on. Maybe uh, sugarcane aphid come into sorghum later on. Uh, later on this year, we're going to be really trying to survey soybean around the state to see what's going on with stink bugs. They, uh, according to Josh Lofton uh, and other reports, they seem to be increasing a little bit in, in uh, their activity. But uh, we typically see them cause more damage later on uh, in the growing season when they're starting to set pods. Um, you you uh, and your team have some uh, uh, great events coming up that you're going to be, you know, to use to kind of study these problems. Talk a little bit about that. Well, one of them is we're going to be introducing a scouting system for sugarcane aphid this year. So we want to start bringing it out to the producers and let them use it. It's a really fast, rapid way to gauge whether you need to treat for sugarcane aphid or not. You mentioned fall armyworm. Yes. And you can actually see some um, yeah. uh, damage right here. Absolutely. So let's just kind of go over an overview of how you can scout and what are some signs that you might have a fall armyworm Well, a lot of problem. people are gonna get concerned when they see something like this because it looks bad. Um, this isn't necessarily the uh, time that you need to worry about fall armyworm or uh, headworms um, in the whirl because they aren't really causing that much yield loss. When the head comes out, and they start feeding on the seeds. The critical things for, for headworms is that you catch them at the right growth stage when they're small so that um, you, excuse me, so that you can uh, uh, get effective control. Now, Tom, you also have a trap that's a great 
a tool to use to see when flights are coming in and the, the time when people might need, producers might need to start thinking about controlling. Yeah, the key to fall armyworm is that they don't overwinter in Oklahoma, so we see flights coming in from Texas and the Gulf Coast and places like that. So we have a trap that uh, is baited with a scent that attracts males, and we can tell when those flights are coming in. Gives an early alert, early alert to producers to be out watching for that insect. The bottom is really sticky and gooey. It's baited with a uh, pheromone that attracts males. They think there's a female in the trap. They come in, they get stuck, and that's the end. But it lets us know what kind of flight activity we're seeing in uh, any given time. All right, thanks, Tom. If you'd like some more information on summer crop pests and fall armyworm, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. With the 4th of July coming up later this week, a lot of us are going to be out celebrating. Oklahoma State University Extension Fire Ecologist John Weir has some tips to help us stay safe around the fireworks. People shooting fireworks, again, try to, you know, determine what the wind direction is, where the embers, where the fireworks are going to go, and make sure it's not something that flammable downrange or downwind from that source. You know, maybe you may need to mow reduce some of that fuel down. You may need to put some kind of fire breaks in around some of them, if possibility, if you're really concerned about stuff. But most of the people f shooting fireworks, again, get into an area that is non-flammable, nothing else around it, because again, a lot of those fireworks anymore, they can go quite a ways, embers can go quite a ways, and especially if it's dry and windy, it can be a big time problem. Also, probably need to have some type, some type of source of water, some type of suppression, something on site so that if something was to happen, you can try to hop on it as quick as you can. Welcome to the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Parts of the West dried out a little this week, allowing the wheat harvest to continue in full swing, while rains in the East kept up the seemingly endless wet conditions there. Looking at a 30-day rainfall map from Wednesday, we see just how much more rain has fallen in the east compared to the west. Let's focus on two stations to illustrate this point further. Miami in the east had received 9.8 inches. Boy City in the west recorded only 2.82 inches. The soil moisture maps indicate the result. Here is the average 4 inch percent plant available water for the state on June 25th. Boy City shows 9 percent while Miami is near 100 percent. Deeper in the soil we see the same situation. 13 percent moisture at Boy City and 99 percent at Miami. Another way to look at this difference is with a fractional water graph for each site. At Miami, it has been wet near saturation for the last 30 days. At Boise City, it started out moist, but due to less rainfall and higher evaporation rates, the soils are now nearing the dry end of the scale. It would be great if the next rains targeted the west and skipped the wetter east. Now here's Gary discussing summer forecasts. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. I thought we might take a look at the rain thus far in 2019 just for a little bit of perspective. What's happened thus far? And also take a look as we transform summer into fall. Take a look at the Mesonet rainfall map from the start of the year all the way through June 26. Now we go from about 8 inches out in the far western Oklahoma panhandle all the way up to more than 45 inches in far northeastern Oklahoma and around 35 to 40 inches uh, across much of eastern Oklahoma. So lots of rain everywhere and we take a look at that as the departure from normal for that same time frame. We do see those uh, massive uh, surpluses as we go from west central up through northeastern Oklahoma, of course covering much of north central Oklahoma, and then again down in far southeastern Oklahoma. Now for the year thus far, the far western panhandle is sitting right about normal. 
Um, so that's a little bit shocking, but uh, when we look at the overall statewide average, we do see that it was the fourth wettest on record, uh, about eight inches above normal. Again, that is dominated though by the, those surpluses from west central up through northeastern Oklahoma. Now let's take a look at the outlooks for the July through September period. These are from the Climate Prediction Center. The temperature outlook shows increased odds of below normal temperatures across virtually the entire state, especially up in the northwestern and north central Oklahoma. Only the far southeastern and far western panhandle sections are excluded. About the same picture when we look at the uh, precipitation outlook, increased odds of above normal precipitation across the entire state, but especially across northwestern uh, and north central over into northeastern Oklahoma. We could definitely use a cooler than normal summer. I'm not sure we want a wetter than normal summer after all the rainfall we've had, but we'll just have to see how it goes. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're here with Oklahoma State Floriculture Professor Bruce Dunn talking about hydroponics. And Bruce, what exactly is hydroponics? So hydroponics differs than traditional production in that we're growing without soil. So as the name indicates, so hydro meaning water and ponus meaning labor. And so basically it's just a system of growing plants in water and nutrients. The traditional kind of hydroponic system uses just uh, growing the plants in the water, but you can add some substrates in there too as well, like this hydrogen or uh, perlite, for example, in order to grow those crops. So when we think about hydroponics, or when most people do, they're thinking about growing fruits or vegetables, but there's actually hydroponic systems that can be utilized like on the family farm in for their production purposes. Absolutely. So actually I was uh, just uh, recently uh, had a farmer that contacted me and was interested in hydroponic fodder production, which differs than just traditional kind of vegetable hydroponic system is that for the vegetables, we generally grow those out for maturity. And so something like lettuce, it might be something like uh, about uh, five to seven weeks, but uh, for other ones like tomatoes it might be two months. But in the fodder system here, it's basically just growing sprouts. And so after about five to 10 days, you're able to produce a fodder crop. So it, what could that be utilized for? Could, would it be utilized for like forage purposes? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times they'll use it to supplement uh, feed specifically or forage. And so a lot of times during the winter time and you can use different crops in there. So you can use wheat, rye, uh, they'll even use like sorghum and maize too in there too as well. But barley is probably the number one uh, seed that they'll use for that system. So how long does it take I mean, you mentioned five to seven days. You put this in, uh, you know, a week ago, and you're already starting to get some sprouts coming up. How long does it take before you're actually ready to, and, and what goes into that actually, like, harvesting this? Right, so it's a fairly simple process. So basically, we'll take seed, and so if we take one pound of seed, we can expect about seven pounds of fodder back from that system. So we'll take seed, soak it in like a five-gallon bucket for 24 hours just in water. And then the next day we'll soak it in, we'll add some either like 1% bleach or hydrogen peroxide into that system. Then that'll just kind of sterilize it to make sure that we don't get any mold to start developing in that system. Generally, like I said, it's probably about uh, five days for something like wheat and rye, but something like oats, it takes a lot longer, about 10 days. They can also use it to supplement, as I mentioned before, something like uh, chickens and goats. And you can even use it for uh, cattle too as well, but it just depends on uh, the system here because there is that extra cost associated with this system. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. You know why this is a great, it could be a great option. It's not an option for everybody. Right, so it depends completely on your system. So there's places where they found that this system will actually reduce costs by 30%, but that's in areas where uh, there's limited water and there's also high feed costs to get forage or forage is not readily available. And you actually have a conference coming up uh, uh, here in the next few weeks that can help uh, producers and people uh, people who aren't producers learn more about hydroponics. Right, so we do have one, it's a soilless crop production conference. It's gonna be held here on the campus of Oklahoma State University. And so basically the conference is on July 10th. It's gonna be an all day conference. So we'll talk about growing different crops. We'll talk about insects, uh, diseases in there too as well. And just kind of introduce what are some of these different types of hydroponic systems. All right, thanks Bruce. If you'd like more information on the upcoming crops conference, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu.
Well, the rain stopped for a while, which means that combines are in the field across Oklahoma. They're getting the, the, the crop cut and, and the combines are starting to roll into to, uh, Kansas as well. Kim, what's happening with the wheat price? Well, your local wheat prices go back to the first of the month in Oklahoma, $4.70, $4.75. Stayed there about a week, fell down to the 4.30 to 4.35 uh, range, watered around there a couple of days, then back up to 4.63, and now back down to 4.50. In other words, we've got some volatility in this market. As you look at price and as you look at the markets, I think you've got to look at the situation where soft red winter wheat prices are 65 cent premium to hard red winter wheat prices. You just don't see that very often. That kind of tells you what's going on in the market. What's driving all of this volatility? Well, if you look at that, I think uh, quality in the hard red winter wheat, our test weights, a little lighter than we'd like, but still good milling uh, test weight. Uh, the uh, protein coming in reports, what, 9% to 13%. This time last year, you had 10 to 14 or 15%, probably averaging 11, maybe a little less than that. So not the protein we'd like. Export sales have been good, but I think expectations are that they're gonna lighten up a little bit. I think you've got to take into consideration that between 20 and 20 five percent of the world's wheat production for the 2019-20 marketing year has already been harvested and it's in the bin and you got to consider what's going on in the Black Sea area. We always do talk about the Black Sea. What are we seeing right now? Well, if you look at Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan's production probably a little bit below average. Russia, it, you know, it's running about 10% above last year. The Ukraine, that's what we, we don't talk much about Ukraine, but right. their production is supposed to be up about 10% are 20% and overall in the Black Sea around 10%. They're going into this marketing year with relatively tight supplies, so they're where we got a 10% increase in production, we're only looking at a little over 5% increase in exports. They're controlling the market. The last cargo that I got priced out on FOB was $5.33. That's about $4 wheat in Oklahoma. What, what, what does that 20 to 25% that has been harvested, how, how is that impacting the market? Well, if you look at who it is, it's India. Uh -huh. uh, they're one of the world's largest producers. They've got a record crop, uh, they're self-sufficient, and they will export more wheat this year than they normally do. Pakistan, above average production, again, self-sufficient. Their excess, they'll put on expect, export market. They've have, they'll have more to market this year. Egypt, above average production, the number one importer, which means they're going to import less wheat. And so that, I think that has a long-term impact on our export potential. And I don't believe it's as good as it was last year. Recently, you've been saying September's kind of that, 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 that hot shot area that, that ag producers need to be looking for to sell their wheat. Are we still going to lean towards that? I'm leaning towards that because look at what's going on in the Black Sea. Uh, right now, they're, they're already uh, harvesting, but it's not coming in. Their main crop comes in in that August time period. It hits the market late August and September for shipping. And as that Black Sea wheat comes on the market, they, I mean, They've got a, a, an advantage to us, both cost-wise and location-wise, and when theirs hits the market, our export demand goes down, uh, goes lower, and our price goes down. I think the quality product right. is tight enough so that if we lose Black Sea this year, and there's a potential, not much, yeah. but a, a chance, then we could see a three or four dollar increase in prices. Man, that'd be nice. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. If you're in the market for a frying pan, there are many types available. So today I thought I'd talk about three options that are available, their similarities, and their differences. Everyone knows about and probably has a stainless steel pan. They're lightweight, durable, rust resistant, and don't require any special cleaning, just a little soap, hot water, and they're good to go. They also won't react with acidic foods such as tomato sauce. So in other words, the food won't pick up any off flavors. Stainless steel pans are also lightweight and conduct heat easily. However, this also means that they tend to lose heat quickly. You're probably also familiar with cast iron pans, but you may not have heard about carbon steel. They both have many similarities. However, they can react with acidic foods. Both carbon steel and cast iron pans need to be seasoned with oil, which serves two purposes. One, it prevents them from rusting after they've been cleaned, 
and two, it allows them to build up a coating or patina that acts as a near non-stick surface. However, this means that they should only be cleaned with a stiff brush and hot water, no soap, then immediately dried and a thin coating of oil applied all over. One difference between these two types of pans is how they're made. Cast iron pans are made by molten iron being cast or poured into a mold, while carbon steel pans are made from large sheets of steel that are pressed into forms that take the shape of the pan. This difference in manufacturing also affects the look and feel of the pans. The surface of cast iron tends to be more rough and irregular grain, while the surface of carbon steel tends to be much more smooth. However, the biggest difference between carbon steel and cast iron is that a carbon steel pan will be lighter than an equivalently sized cast iron pan. So the next time you're in the market or shopping for a frying pan, hopefully these tips will have been helpful. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or visit fapc.biz or download the FAPC app. Well, that does it for us this week on SunUp. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From the North Range Cattle Research Center, I'm Dave Deacon. We'll see you next time. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SunUp.